Verdigris is a moderately transparent bluish green color. The name Verdigris comes from the old French Verdigrettes, an alteration of Vert de Gris, or roughly translated in English to Green of Grease. It was used as a pigment in paintings and other art objects as a green color mostly imported from Greece. Verdigris was easy and cheap to produce. In 18th century Montpellier, France, it was manufactured in household cellars. Where copper plates were stacked in clay pots filled with distilled wine, the verdigris was scraped off the metal and ground into pigments weekly by the women of the household. The French verdigris industry was almost exclusively controlled by women. No one is sure why this trade in particular fell to women, but it is well documented that the practices were passed down from mother to daughter, growing an industry in which women could support themselves. Surprisingly, the woman of Montpelier, while increased verdigris use meant poisoning was becoming increasingly common, causing symptoms of nausea, anemia, or even death, when 19th century scientists went to the source of the verdigris to study the health of the women who produced it, they found nothing. One scientist hypothesized that the fumes of wine that women were exposed to daily helped them develop an immunity to the toxicity of verdigris. Verdigris as a pigment was the most vibrant green available until the 19th century. It is typically more blue when it's first applied and develops its full green hue over the first month or so following application. Today, it's rarely sold as an artist pigment due to its toxic nature. To anyone living in the 21st century, it might not be obvious that the Renaissance paintings were once much more colorful than they look now. Verdigris eventually fell out of use by artists as more stable green pigments became available. If you've seen an old rusty penny, you've seen verdigris in nature. It's the greenish blue pantina that forms on copper, bronze, or brass when it's exposed to moisture. The most popular example that comes to mind for most is the Statue of Liberty. It was a rainy October day in 1886 and the Statue of Liberty was shrouded in a French flag. The weather was miserable and the ceremonial unveiling went poorly. The drapery was pulled off too soon, right in the middle of a speech, and the fireworks display had to be canceled and rescheduled. Still, over a million freezing New Yorkers came out, including a boat full of suffragettes. They were protesting during the opening ceremonies, objecting to the use of a female figure to symbolize liberty when American women didn't have the right to vote. Her thin, copper skin has changed quite a bit since her debut in 1886. Growing a gorgeous layer of verdigris pantina, helped along by the salty ocean air she is exposed to day after day. The verdigris layer protects the underlying metal from corrosion and degradation, which is why copper, brass, and bronze sculptures are so durable. When the statue first started to turn green, people in positions of authority wondered what to do. In 1906, New York newspapers printed stories saying that the statue was soon to be painted. The public did not like this idea, leading to a massive outcry. In the end, the change was accepted and her green skin stayed. Although painting the Statue of Liberty has been suggested several times over the years, it has not been done. However, the torch, which was originally copper, corroded after a renovation to install windows. In the 1980s, the original torch was cut away and replaced with one coated with gold leaf. In modern times, many have tried to imitate the color effects of the Statue of Liberty by artificial means. To architects and artists, generally, this color effect is considered a type of perfection. One of the most beautiful examples of metal coloring in the world today.